Okay, uh, I guess I will get started. Uh, and uh, let's see, let me. Okay, uh, I, I think I, I, um, let me just quickly, um, I, I checked earlier that I think I like still, um, I haven't received all the assignment yet, so, uh, I will talk about like the first homework that like, once I receive all the assignment. But, uh, let, let's see. I, I, let me check again if I I have Evans assignment. Yeah, I don't think I have everyone yet. So I guess I, I won't. Oh, okay. Let let me see. Uh, I don't know what's wrong. Like uh, this uh, earlier, the mic is good. Like last time, I I, I think. Uh, okay. It seems like Zoom tends to have this problem. Like every time it's to set up, just change a little bit. I, I I hope it's uh let's see, let me um, I mean it looks like that's the the loudest that I can set. I don't know why this so so uh, so can you hear that now? Let's see if I can Yes, now it's better. So um I will use uh, so I, I will use a, this my tab to instead. Okay, so um, so I guess I just just uh. I won't talk about the solution of the homework because I didn't receive everyone's homework yet. But um, uh, let me just a quick comment about the Monte Carlo part for the history credit. Um, I, I think like, um, so some of you guys like, uh, uh, without going into the detail of the, the questions and so on, remember that like we basically have like two days, right? Um, either rainy days or like sunny day like and then like we have a distribution like for different temperature like maybe i don't know the number but like for different temperatures like for rainy days then this is a like temperature going up right so for rainy day like it it just uh will be colder cooler and then the sunny days is like a little bit warmer something like that and then like uh some of you guys say um wrote a program for example to find the expectation of the temperature um as simply like uh just by the definition of computing the expectation using um using the program basically so it's something like uh let's say this is like p t1 given okay let me Right back. Uh, so this is like, let's say temperature one, temperature two, temperature three, T4, that's T5, T6, T7, right? So this will be like by definition is equal to probability L times the expectation of uh, why I'm writing here. Let me let me move give more space here. It's equal to um probability L multiplied by the expectation of t given r plus probability of s expectation of t given s and then here like he talks in that is like this will be like t1 for example then p t2 
T1 given L, that's basically reading, reading from the, uh, the problem itself, and then sum over all this like, up to T4, let's say T, T4 given L, and the same for this part. Um, of course, you, it gives you the coerce. Okay, of course, I here I assume you already get the steady state probability for PR and PS. And of course, this gives you the coerce solution for the expectation of T, but uh, this is not Monte Carlo simulation. So for Monte Carlo simulation, you are supposed to really do a simulation in the sense like for each day, maybe today is like day one, and day one I have, now it's rainy and temperature is so or it's TT whatever like maybe twenty five degrees and and then I, in day two I based on day one I I simulate what day two supposed to be maybe sunny is like twenty eight and so and so forth and then maybe you one foot experiment for like ten thousand days and for example out of that I I can compute the approximation of probability of sunny, let's say, right, will be just counting how many of these days, out of these 10,000 days will be uh, sunny. So maybe like this will be number of uh, sunny over 10,000. And this gives you an approximation of this probability. That, that's the Monte Carlo simulation. So, um, uh, so just want to comment on that because, um, yeah. And of course, I, we, we can do this um, because of the um, law of large number right, uh, we discussed last time, right? Even though, as I said, like for this example, actually law of large is a bit beyond law of large number because in, in law of large number, we assume each of the variable here, uh, IID. So I'm here, but it's not exactly IID. This is a... Um, actually like they, they have correlation for adjacent variables here. But this will still converge if you do a Monte Carlo simulation like this, it will still converge, but it will be based on like some uh, ergodic theory that is, I mean, um, the teleco component will be, I mean, proof and so on will be beyond us in this class, but it's good to know that it's, it's um, basically same principle as like um, um, same idea as a, uh, uh, a law of large number but it will be if you want to really give a rigorous proof for that it would be a bit beyond just law of large number and um, so uh, any questions some comment on that or, or like anything uh, regarding the the homework assignment but uh, I can answer you without disclosing the entire solution. So because I, I didn't receive all the assignment yet. Um, so, okay, I guess I, I, uh, I don't have any question for the moment. I, I, let me shut down, uh, turn off my uh, mic on the other side, that may be some echo. Okay, I'm not sure it's better now. So, um, okay. What I'm going to do today, I, I will just first uh, do a uh, rather quick review of um, what we ended last time. What we ended like last time is talking about uh, the, <coughs> uh, the source coding theorem. And uh, we said that like, it's also actually, again, like, it's based on law of large number. And we, we, we say that like we have a discrete memoryless source, basically it's going to output um, each time you sample, like, um, I mean, get one sample from this source here. And this discrete memoryless source is, of course it's discrete. So let's say have a distribution P px here so each time i sample like x1 and x2 and so on then uh in that <clears throat> in the proof there what we what we 
did there is that we basically pull out a sequence uh, from that source free sample, like maybe n times, and n is water big, and then in total, like we have n samples here, and then we look at like how many information there, and we said that like okay, what we looked at last time is like if we look at the minus log p x, well, then maybe I should say say like this. So if I look at uh, x1, I sample each of these, and then I look at the probability of x1, probability of x2, and so on, of the probability of xn, and say if I look at the minus log of this thing, and we sum over them all together, so basically if I consider sum of i minus log pxi, so, and, um, this would be just equal to minus log p or maybe first thing first, say this thing because of law of large number, it was just like um, converge to expectation of minus log p x y. And uh, the sum on the right hand side on the other hand will be just equal to uh, minus log product of p x y p x i i so I, I instead of i have a sum i would just say in, instead of sum of log i will have just uh, a log product of uh, log a part of something and then this will be of course because like here we assume this source is id, so then like this pxi will be just equal to minus log pxy, and x is the probability of that sequence. We pull out this sequence, and the probability of this sequence, if we take log of that, will converge to this guy here. And this expectation, of course, is just a constant, and we, we say that last time we defined this as hx, that's the entropy of the source. Oh, okay. I I always make this mistake. Let, let me see. I I need to be careful. Like I okay. This sum won't converge to expectation of x y. Instead, I have uh, the mean will converge to expectation of x. So I should have like say one over n. Right. I want to and this one will converge to expectation of x. So therefore I will have um, one over n here also. Minus one over n, I have minus one over n here, right? So therefore I will have this guy will converge to hx or we will say like px. For whatever sequence we are drawing from this discrete, discrete memory less source, that probability of that sequence will converge to two to the minus n x x. So you basically just flip the term, you get this this number here. So we um, then we argue, okay, each of these properties the same. So therefore, like um, the uh, this is a uh, this is equally partition basically the probability space is equally partitioned. I mean, we mentioned the term like asymptotic equal partition. But just referring to the fact that like, you have all the sequence, whenever you pull out, they essentially have the same probability. And based on that, we, we argue, okay, therefore like the, um, the, uh, the, uh, for such a distribution, if we want to like label all the sequence, the number of bits to store these labels will be just NHX, something like that. Um, I, I want to make it more concrete this time. So it's basically repeating some, some things we are saying here, but um, I want to define something long as typical sequence so it, it sounds like a little bit tautology because I, um, 
as you will see like why I say that. So we say something is typical a, or like typical, a typical sequence is something exactly referring to a sequence, let's say this X. So we, we, let's say we, 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 we also like consider a sequence of length and X. The, uh, so the length is N, so length N, a typic, typical sequence of length N. Um, we'll say it's like a typical sequence if that probability is bounded by two to minus N H X minus some epsilon and two to minus N H X plus epsilon. So this epsilon is very small. So epsilon is supposed to be small. So, okay, that, that's why I say like this is kind of like a tautology because uh, we make the different definition in such a way that like, as we show in this law of large number on this other side here, right? So it's saying that like for whatever sequence we are drawing from this discrete memory less source, if we draw the sequence like, with a sufficiently long length, let's say this n is rather big, like 10,000, 100,000, then that sequence will have probability will be close to two to n matrix where we told to this guy here. So therefore like we define something like that. It's saying that like um, we are basically expecting like any sequence drawing from this source here, as long as th this sequence is sufficiently large or like, uh, or I should say like n is sufficiently big, or let me be right here for any epsilon bigger than zero, say like any reasonably any epsilon, it can be however small the epsilon, and uh, for sufficiently sufficiently large n, we will have like x drawing from this discriminant source. This is a length length n. X drawing from this discrete memory, memory less source uh, will be always will always be typical. Eh? So, um, a, a, any question here? So, it it, it sounds like uh, a a little bit silly to make a definition like that because. Uh, but it's it's just like make things rigorous in my in my discussion here here like like we ended pretty quickly a little bit hand waving here like once we define more concretely then we we can uh, make our argument uh, more like rigorous. So then like we we have the definition of the typical sequence. Um, we can also define the set of this typical sequence set of typical sequences. So this set we will come to know by this a uh, epsilon n x. So we say the distribution with p x here. We have this epsilon here with this n here. It's precisely defined as the set of all these typical sequences. So this is basically so it's just something like two to the minus n h x plus epsilon less than p x and uh, 2 to minus n h x minus epsilon. So uh, now we, we came that like, we have a set like that, then, okay, let, let me just make sure you guys, uh, this may be a silly question, but let, let me, let me ask this question anyway, like simple question, like Q, Q1, really simple. So um, what, what, what is the size, the size of, I, I, I shouldn't say it's a simple question, but it's a question that I already answered that. Like, so I just make sure what, whether you follow or not. So what is the size of A epsilon NX? Size meaning that like how many sequences in this A epsilon n x. Oh, 
or maybe I should say at the approximate size because you you cannot get the uh, it will be a bound right? so it's like or like uh not not quite right um so let, let's think of like what, what we have here so we have the definition of typical is basically all the x that will have probability as say same probability say like almost same probability as as this one here so so this definition sounds funny but it's like just like um make um our discussion, I mean, make our language a little bit easier to say. So again, like if you think of like what's typical, typical essentially just means that like any sequences pulling out for, from this discrete memory light source will be typical because by law of large number, that X will have probability close to this guy here. Then we just define something is typical whenever this is probability of that sequence is close to again like this guy. So the information we have here is like we will have like all the sequences drawing drawing from this discrete memory line source will be typical and they will have probability close to this guy here. Uh, anyone have okay let me let me um let me let me cup um skip this for the moment and then I like, come back to this let's say okay um not quite white actually because I your x here so I have this uh, source here is a uh, discrete so let's say uh, therefore the alphabet size is fixed right let's say I have the alphabet size is x let's say x is equal to I mean this is just equal to two let's say just can be zero or one then um, because like the I have I'm considering all the length and sequence right so then like the total number of sequence can, if I consider like any sequence, I don't care whether it's typical or not, the number of sequence like at most will be just two to n, right? And in general, like if I have the alphabet size is x here, the total number of sequences can only by uh, x to the power n, right? But the number of typical sequences will be less than this because I have additional constraint here saying that like, I, I will need the sequence to satisfy this condition here. Right? So let, let me maybe um, think, let me give a new, let you guys think of a numerical example first, maybe it will give you a little bit more concrete idea before like coming back to this question again. So let's say I have this question two here. So let's say I have a bias con, let's say bias con, right? And I have a probability of hat uh, is equal to 0 0.7, let's say it's a bit biased. Um, and um, now I have, I, I will ask like uh, two questions here. So the first question is like, let's say I, I, I will fold this con like um, 10,000 times, uh, okay. So therefore, like n is equal to ten thousand, let's say. 
So what will be the most, what will be, what is the, or what is the most, most probable sequence? So um, here I'm referring to something as sequence, meaning that like I fold this cons like 10,000 times, I may get hat tail, hat, hat, hat tail, 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 something like that. That would be a sequence, right? So, um, I mean, uh, the most probable sequence would be something like any combination of like head and tail, like with a length of 10,000. So, so first question I'd like to ask is like, what would be the most probable sequence there? And then I, the second question I say is the most probable sequence Yes, 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 yes. Um, that that's good. So uh, I hope the others see that also. Um, proposed sequence, typical. So um, So uh, let, let, let me let me answer this first one. Like following like what what Sim has like sent us. So um, so then then I will come back to this one. Or let me yeah. Then we will come back to this one. Let, let's let's look at this like why why we have the signs is that again. So think of like. Um, Let's see. <clears throat> Think of I have again. I let me write it here again. Like my sequence is typical if like it's bounded by two to the minus n h x minus epsilon and two to the minus n h x. Oops. plus epsilon. Um, now we, we think of like all the sequences, right? So if I, I think of like the entire probability space, because like you you have all these sequences, I like basically probability, what probability is, is uh, the definition is like if probability is equal to one, meaning that like um, it has to be happy it has to have to be happen or like, like it all as, uh, I don't know what, what I'm saying. I mean, basically probability cannot be more than one. That's by definition. So if I consider like the sum of all the sequences that is typical and sum the probability of all these sequences, like sequences that is typical, and this has to be bounded by one way. So I, I cannot have that sum of probabilities is bigger than one because all these outcomes are deep. They they are they are kind of uh, what what's that word like distinct from each other. So therefore, like if they sum up together, they they cannot be larger than one. And uh, and so and this p x so by this bound here, like of course p x from the definition here is bigger than equal to two to the minus n h x plus epsilon, right? And just using this bound here on this other side, on this side, on the left-hand side. And of course, I this term here is actually a constant, does not depend on x. Know that like this is, I should be careful write this as a small x. So, and uh, this p small x here is bounded by this guy and this is actually a constant. So I can pull it out. So if I pull it out, it's just equal to two minus n h 
Uh, my handwriting is horrible. Uh, H, X plus epsilon. And this is sum one over X, A, epsilon, and X. But this is basically just counting the number of sequences in this set here, right? So therefore, this guy is just equal to the uh, size of this set here. Right. So then I move things on the other side, and I will have this is bounded by 2 to the minus n h x plus epsilon. And then I, in a similar token, like because everything has to be typical, so I can argue that like if I sum over everything, all the typical sequences. This probability is not equal to one, but it should be very close. It should be arbitrarily close to one, right? So I can claim something like this is bigger than one over delta, one minus delta. And delta is like for any delta, if I pick a sufficiently large n, so I always have this to be true. So I can always say, oh, you can give me a delta, but I pick a long enough, large enough n, then I can be sure that like all this p here, I mean, all this x here, like every x here I'm drawing will be typical. And so therefore, like the sum of all these typical, se probability of all these typical sequences will be, can be arbitrarily close to one. So therefore, it will be bigger than one minus, F, one minus delta here. And again, I here I will then will use this bound here, will be less than equal to two to the minus n h x minus epsilon. Then I can move the turn around. Uh, uh, okay, I, again, okay, this is bounded by that, but again, I I should have sum over x a epsilon n x, and again, this is just equal to a epsilon n x. So then oh, I will have the size of this set of typical sequences will be um, lower bounded by, uh, so this means that like A epsilon n x, okay, I should shut the window, it's too loud. Okay. So it, this will be just equal to, okay, this will be just uh, lower bounded by one minus delta, like two to the minus n h x minus epsilon. Okay, that's been no minus to the n. Yeah, something like that. So I, so we include this guy here, so it will be like something like that, right? So um, that does give us a more um, rigorous argument than we, we hand waved the, like earlier. You say that like the number of uh, sequences, I mean, these typical sequences will be like two to n tricks, but now we can say more vigorously, saying that like they are precisely will be like bounded by this plus epsilon and minus epsilon uh, times this one minus delta and so on. So, but anyway, like um, the argument score will be the same. The number of typical sequences will be approximately two to the two to the n h x here, and we can index each of these typical sequences like with a label. So I can have this discrete memory source coming in. Then I can have an encoder is basically, I have this sequence of length n here. I can have this encoder here. It essentially just label all these typical sequences in this set here. So I can have label one, two, three, four, and so on. And the lump of labels I need will be just a like two to the n h x way. So I will need uh, basically, 
will encode into two to the anatrix label and two to anatrix label will be like your anatrix bit, right? So therefore, again, I, uh, this is why, where we ended last time. So therefore, like if we have a source from this discrete memory source with Px here, we take, when we compress a sequence of length n, when n is sufficiently large, we, we need NHX for NHX bits for that. So therefore, on average, each sample from this discrete, discrete memory less source, we need HX bits for that. So therefore, like we say, the information content or whatever, people call it entropy of this discrete memory less source is HX. So um, that, that is actually um, a, a little bit of reveal, but at the same time, like uh, make things uh, vigorous. Uh, as we kind of like um, end the world quickly last time. So now let's, let's go back to this earlier question, the question two here. Let's say again, if I have a bias con, now uh, the bias con have that probability of hat is a bit higher, like 0.7, let's say, and I flip it like 10,000 times. Um, and um, and I will get a sequence, right? And of course, this is a it's a random sequence because I, this is a random process here. The questions are like, what will be the most possible most probable sequence? What was the sequence that have the highest probability? And also like. Uh, is this sequence typical? So can Is the question here? Like, I I will give you a little bit time to think about that. Like, how about like four or five minutes? So I, I'm not so clear about this question. Yes. So uh, so the question is is that means I need to find the head tail head tail this the most probable that kind yes. of yes yes. So you, you just yes. uh, how many head and how many tails? Uh, um, okay, the first one, the first, first, first one. So it would be the, let's say the precise, you have different sequences where you can, something like, let's say if I have just a sequence of length n, uh, n is equal to five, let's say, I can have like head, 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 tail, tail, or like maybe tail, head, head, had tail. So this can be counted as two different sequences. So um, so Professor, you want to know how many of these sequences will be, let's say, for n is equal to 10,000, right? With given probability. Which, which one will be most probable? So um, like we have how many uh, kind of these heads and tails? Uh, you mentioned this five. So like if we have five choices, uh, then making every different sequence, there will be a lot of sequences, yes. right? Yes, yes. It's, it's a combinatorial yeah. problem, I think. Yeah. Yes. So yes. If, if it's yes. 10,000. Yes, yes, but, 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 but yeah. Well, so for uh, for n is equal to five, and uh, if the coin is biased is not biased, we will have like thirty two sequences. Yeah. Okay. But, okay. Let, let's uh, start with that five then. Which, which one is the highest probability out of this? That uh, you have thirty two sequences. Which one uh, has highest probability? Which one is the highest probability? Okay. So. Oh, by the way, you guys. Uh, I, I would like to. 
uh, grant you guys the extra credit that you, you guys want to type your answer in the chat also because I, I cannot figure out who answered that. Yeah, <laughs> of course, I, it's great you guys discuss like this, but be sure also like type your answer in the chat so I can have the record. Yeah. So the, uh, okay, I will type, but the, the sequences which are uh, having both, uh, are, I, I'm talking about the bias, not biased coin. So the sequences which are having uh, like heads and tails both, they will have higher. But uh, for the biased coin, with this given probability like 0.7, uh, so those sequences which have more heads uh, and less tails, they will have higher uh, probability, right? Yes. So, Uma, thank you for your honesty. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, yeah, thank. for anyone that want to type back your question, a uh, solution for question one, I like, uh, welcome to do that also. So, but um. But for this like, second question is clear now, right? So uh, if you, you think like, okay, 10,000 is a lot, so can you, you start with like, let's say just five. Like five, um, uh, and equal to five for the moment and think of out of these 32 sequences, which one has the highest uh, probability? And then afterward, like, um, we will, then you can think of, okay, like, okay, for 32 sequences, that one has the highest one. So therefore, like for uh, sequences of length uh, 10,000, it looks like which one will be has the highest probability. Okay, uh, Drew has an answer. So uh, you guys can agree or disagree with him Like you can put in your, yes. For the first, um,
Yeah, we have some nice discussion here. <clears throat> Uh, excuse me, Dr. Ting. Uh, what's B? Is the most probable sequence? The last word is? Yeah, the most probable sequence is uh, simply meaning the sequence have the highest probability. Uh, what's the last word of this question? Oh, okay. It's just a question mark. Uh, wait, wait, you mean 2B or like 2? Two, um, 2B. 2B, uh, typical. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Two, my second question is like, Okay, for this most probable sequence, is the most probable, oops, uh, why I, okay, let me go back to that. Typical. So typical is, we have the definition here, right? So we say typical. So uh, are you guys uh, have converge for your for your thought like uh, converge to your belief like which one is Um, typical, like you have the definition here. So it, it it looks like a weird definition, but you think of that, like also from the law of large number, whenever you draw a sequence, a long sequence from a discrete memory source, the probability of the sequence that you, you sampled Will, will essentially typical because we'll be bounded by these two things here. So I guess I, uh, you, you guys all converge, let's see. So you, anyone still thinking or like, okay. <coughs> Yeah, I think the cloud is user wide. Yeah, this is a uh, collective um, uh, uh, collective intelligence is always so powerful. Um, So uh, should I continue? Like, I guess I- uh, Professor, guys I know. have a question here, if you yes. can clarify. I have a confusion actually. So yes. uh, do we agree on the first, on 2A part that uh, the sequence with five hats will be the most probable sequence? Um, is, 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 that a, uh, is that the right answer? Yes, that's the right answer. Okay, yeah. okay so if we have, uh, we have hats, so it's mean uh, our entropy will not will be zero. Oh, uh, I'm not. Uh, let, let, let me okay. And entropy will, will be describing the source of um of that source basically, and um uh at least I, 
it's usually you cannot define like the entropy of a just a sequence because I, yeah, that that's basically basically not defined. But if you mean the probability for that, like um, then um, the probability if like all hats would be just say upon seven to the five, I guess. Um, uh, so, sorry, actually, I guess I missed your question. Can you repeat your question again? So uh, actually, I am having confusion that if uh, if we have a certain if we have five hertz, it's mean all those uh, add, there is nothing randomness. So it's mean we don't have entropy. So I was stuck on this point, but uh, you clarified it that if uh, we actually go for the source, uh, we cannot define entropy on a single sequence. Yes, then yes, there will be some entropy, and we will have some calculation of two raised to power negative nh. So I was confused there. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yes, uh, usually when, when you have something is already determined, then you, you don't, you can either say like it's not, or, or maybe a better way to say it's like the entropy will be zero because it's deterministic now. So this is like, it's firm. It can only be like, like that. So therefore like there's no uncertainty there. Like one way to consider entropy is like, it is like um, how much uncertainty for that that piece of information there, because if you think of a source, I'm going to compress it. You can also think of like there's some uncertainty in that source. Therefore, like I need some some storage to store this uncertainty there. So um, again, like in some way, like if something is deterministic, then like this entropy will be zero. Uh, And uh, so I guess I, you guys are correct. Right? So, so isn't that like something is real going on? No. So we have the most probable sequence will be like, uh, let's say if I length 10,000, the most probable sequence will be just all hat, right? So it, all hat. But you guys are also right that like the cloud is white. That sequence won't be typical. So, but from our discussion here is saying that the every sequence you draw from the source will be typical. So the conclusion is saying that like the most probable sequence is actually will not happen basically. So are you guys agree with that? No, professor, we did not get. Can you repeat? But why? <laughs> yeah, but why? Yeah. <laughs> Does it make sense? <laughs> no. So you, you have something like pretty contrary, it looks like. Okay, this is uh, the sequence is most probable. Yes. But it's not but, typical. Yes. And it won't happen. So yes. it's most probable, but it, but it won't happen. So what, what what's the contradiction here? Um, I think. Yeah, maybe I think the most probable event itself is not having much significant in uh, strike contrast to the more typical sequences. So the sum of all the typical sequences combined is much greater than the probability of that one all hat sequence. So that's why that all hat sequence will not occur because there are so many combinations that for all hats to occur, it's uh, very, very rare. Yeah, very good, exactly. So be very careful, Your, our most probable, se probable sequence, there's only one there. And I think at least one of you guys I uh, addressed it correctly. The most probable sequence is uh, approximately, the sequence will be in this case, will, will have like 70% hat, there will be like 7,000 hats, and then like 3,000 tails. There'll be loss of them, will be like what, uh, 10,000, C7000, something like that, so many of them. So therefore, when you combine all of this together, the probability is very high. It's actually almost one. And any, any sequence you pick there <coughs> will be essentially out of this, like so many sequences out there. So therefore, like even though like um, you, you have these sequences are not the, the sequence that have the highest probability, but they are the typical one. That's the one that whenever you pull from that source, you always will get those sequences. Um, okay, I guess this this makes things clear. Uh, I 
Okay, next thing I like to do is I going to um, go for like explain a bit more like I have some property of HX here. Now we have the definition for HX is just a expectation log of this property of X. <coughs> right. Maybe I can go for like some examples and so on. Oh, okay. Actually, I guess we ended at and the last time just say look at like binary source so again if we look at com flipping um then i say if we have the property of hat is just equal to just call it p again <coughs> then this hx we, we uh, let, let let me redo it it doesn't matter it will be like just uh equal to um This will be like just two event, like will be just like uh, maybe I just sum over like sum over like either x can be hat or x can be tail, so it will be like p hat, uh, not p hat minus p tail log p tail, right? So or like I can write minus p <coughs> log p minus one minus p log minus p here and um, so if you you kind of like sketch it out so we have p can be like from zero up to one way right? so we have this p here let's say it's p here this is zero and this is one so we will if you sketch out this um kind of, uh, curve here Okay, I don't, I'm a pretty bad drawer. So I will have something like that. So we'll have P here that is like a 0 0.5 and P is equal to 0 0.5, we'll have probably uh, this HX will be just equal to one. And when we have like P is equal to zero or one, then we will have um, this HX is equal to zero. So, I guess like this also makes sense, right? When you have like P is either zero or one, then that becomes deterministic. So that means that like if I have P is equal to one, that means that I always getting a hat. So there will be no information essentially. So, and and the other way is the same. Like if it's a P is equal to uh, zero, then I will always get a tail. And again, there will be no information. And, um, and of course, I be, be in general, like maybe if I discrete source, then this will be just, for example, if I have X is, uh, can take, let's say the alphabet, like say discrete X here, then this HX minus dot PX here can be written as I sum over this different alphabet, right? and p x log p x here yeah. so that that's for this quick case will be something will be something like that and um, if we look at the expression here <clears throat> p is always uh less than one way right? so therefore like log p is always negative or like minus log p will be always positive right this is like always positive and this is always positive as well. So therefore, like entropy will be always bigger than zero for this quiz source. So we, you, I, this is again a, a remark we need to be careful. Like for this quiz source, HX is always bigger than zero. Now the problem here is say, like, let's say if I X is continuous, if X continuous, So if I try to define HX, what is HX? Let's say if like uh, I have uh, X is uniform from zero to one, let's say this is a uniform distribution. So, okay, this would be one here. Um,
So what do you guys think? Is that clear what I'm saying? So I am here, like I, I am saying like this too, this is a general case when like X is discrete with, um, yes, I, I guess you have a typo of like, you want to log PX? Yeah. So in that case, I, we, we cannot do a summation here, but actually that will be a different definition that we will define something as this, um, this people call it differential entropy. So it's basically it's just like a definition for continuous random variable. So we define something like this. So when X is continuous, we'll just define instead like using integral instead of like, but then I know that like this actually is like, you cannot um, directly interpret this HX um, as amount of information for this X here. Actually, it's not quite right. So for which, um, which new here, like if I use the original definition, my problem is not, it's the exact the opposite. I will get something like infinite because in this case, if you think of that, like you, we use this like, definition to think of like uh, the amount of information because I like, ultimately you think of how you interpret HX, you can think of like, if I have a discrete memory source and with this distribution of this X, I'm pulling out a sample from this X. Per sample, how much information do I have there? If my source here is actually continuous, that's actually very bad. If I want to get infinite precision for this X, then actually the amount of information here is infinite as well. So I only when you are allowed to have finite precision, then the amount of information for this source will be um, will be finite. So therefore, like in general, like if you try to use HX, the, the original definition for continuous sources will be undefined because um, it, it will be, you will just get something infinite. So that's why like, as Robert said, like we, we would like to make it like, okay, use this definition. This is, actually I'm jumping a little bit ahead. I, I, let, but it's okay, like differential entropy. We will look a little bit more, like, like give a, a couple more example here, but like basically we just, this is very simple, like we just change the definition. Instead of using a summation, we change to an integral. And of course, like for continuous random variable, like these are not the, not the, not the probability exactly or like not the probability mass function, but the probability density function. So therefore, when you think of PX itself, it's not the probability upon X here, but only when you say PX delta X will give a probability, this will give approximately probability at X uh, count. Uh, X between X plus delta X and uh, X minus delta X, something like that. Oh, uh, I put, put over two, something like that. So, but uh, anyway, like we will we, get to that like later on. But also maybe like it's good to still like give a remark here. Know that like for discrete random variable, we say HX from here, we see that like HX has to be bigger than equal to zero, right? And be careful that like when we play with this, this differential entropy, this no longer true because like this, now the HX, this small HX here does not actually represent, a, it's kind of like related, but like not literally represent the amount of information from the source per sample. So, so therefore, like this can be negative. Actually, this can can be negative. Of course, it can be positive or negative. It can be anything basically, but it won't be bounded lower bounded by zero. So, but don't worry too much about that. We'll come back to this one again. But let let's focus with the uh, discrete case first again. 
So we already have one lower bound for that. So HX is lower bounded by zero. So can, can you guess the upper bound? Let's say if X have the alphabet size of, or like, um, or I say like, X is the alphabet, and uh, the alphabet size is written like this. This is the size of the alphabet. So what what would be the upper bound of H X? Can can you guess? So someone have a, maybe I, I don't know what this is, a question plea or something like that. Again, like, uh, you don't look, need to look into the math here, but think of like, what does it mean by HX again from, from the uh, physical picture? Again, always think of this physical picture. HX is something like that. Uh, that's a good guess, but like, be, be careful in general if like my alphabet size is this square X here. So what will it be? So I have a discrete map. So one is a good guess, but again, like, um, one will be correct when your size of the alphabet is two. That's when like you like flipping a conic and only be zero or one. But let's say if I have um, this discrete memory less source is a is a dice. Let's say I I I. I toss the dice and then I, I got six outcome here, one, two, six here. And um, anyone want to modify the Okay, I'll give you give you guys one minute. But but this is a very good page. Always remember this is helpful. Like you, you don't need to look at the equations, but remember this gives you quite a lot of uh, um, intuition as well. So HX, where, where HX is coming from? HX is just if you have a discrete memory source with distribution PX, and uh, essentially per sample, the amount of information will be HX. So I, I see like lots of you guys, uh, yes. Maybe write down the question here was, yeah, that's the, all, all they have this here actually. I think this is question three, upper bound of the tricks. I guess I, okay, one thing for you guys I, is, is remember you want to, um, especially when you do actual research is different from like homework problem. The, the, 
the situation is that like you don't have a kind of uh, what's that standard solution that you can go check for that. So therefore, like it's good that you try to check your solution. Like when you, um, when you have a guess of your solution, then you think of okay, if I have my solution as whatever, like you you're given, you just write it down, and then I. So does it work for special case? Let's say for special case, I guess many of you agree that like if my alphabet size is just two, let's say if I kind of uh, toss a coin or something like, like that, um, I, a trick in that case would be just equal to one. So, If I keep toss, keep uh, kind of like flipping a coin say like ten times, each time like uh, the amount of information per sample, per each coin flip, will be bounded by one bit basically. So then like for the equations, you guys just written down there. If you substitute like whatever the alphabet size two there, do you guess the solution one there? Okay, you, you guys settle with your answer. So um, then, so you have some of this. Okay, yes. Yeah, the collective intelligence is usually right. So, um, <clears throat> so anyone want to like, please, please write down your answer. So, um, don't, don't forget like, okay, for channel case, I, not just for like when, for, for a dice, I have six outcomes. I also for channel case, if you have, X outcome, like the size of alphabet, alphabet is X. Maybe, maybe just for your convenience, I call it. Um, I don't want to call it. Yeah, whatever you want to call it, N or K or whatever something. I see some of you guys use N there. Um, So I guess I more or less uh, converge to the solution now. <laughs> yes, it's, um, yes, you're all right. So we should have like log two base X. Um, so that's quite natural, right? Because like you think of that, um, when you have each this, okay, I, I, I'm not sure. Okay, at least this is upper bound. This will always be upper bound because if you think of like 
the alphabet size is this X here, then apparently like I can use, I can only have like so many different outcomes, right? And for example, if I have eight outcomes, like it's up to eight outcome, and this eight outcomes I can be stored in three bits, right? And this three is actually just log to eight, right? So this is, yeah, this is quite lateral. And in general, if like it's not a power of two, but it's still like log base two, something like that. Um, so, and, um, but okay, let, 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 let's show that. Like, so I guess you guys get this right, but uh, let, let's show that it's pretty short, but I guess, uh, let's see. So the, to show that like the easiest way to do that is like, uh, you introduce an inequality, we call it this, Hmm. Let me just make a new one. Something called Jensen's inequality. <clears throat> so it's an inequality like uh, related to convex function. So if you don't remember what is convex function, uh, basically convex function is a, just a ball. So um, something like, like this will be convex. So basically the slope, slope of this function is uh, continuously increasing or like not decreasing at least. Um, so an counter example of not convex would be something like that, right? So the probability of a convex function, of course, like this is I only I'm showing like a one dimensional case. So I can, it's hard for me to sketch, but it's in two dimensional, it's still, it would be exactly like a ball, right? Exactly so like a ball, it would be like 2D case. Um, this is like for convex function. And the exact opposite, if you have a function, it's like flipping a ball, then it'll be, okay, I think my drawing is too horrible. So if like you have a a, a, a ball here, when you flip that, have this other side, it will still be a concave function. And um, so for convex function, like, uh, uh, usually like one way to uh, very easy or like the, the definite one um, a definition of the convex function will be and um, also usually you also very convenient to use it as um, to verify whether the function is convex is like that you, you pick any pawn on the convex function here let's say I have like this x1 and then x2 here so if I draw a line like across these two points here, a straight line. Then if this function is convex, then this straight line should be on top of this curve here, right? On top of this function here. So therefore, like let's say if I have function, this is function f here, then the function is convex, then I should have something like f, uh, any point on this line, basically any points on this line, uh, will be like a greater sum of x1 and x2, right? So I can have like a pawn here is like uh, alpha times x1 plus one minus alpha times x2, uh, and where alpha is like from zero to one, let's say. And I consider a pawn, any pawn on there, and uh, my, my pawn here, alpha x1 plus one minus alpha x2, uh, the location of this pawn here will be, will be, uh, um, how should I? Okay, it's a little bit, maybe, let me, uh, 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 so how, I, I should make it bigger. So, okay, okay, let me, let me move it here. So let me move it here. So I want to say like a pawn here, there's a linear combination like, of this x1 and x2 here. 
So the pawn on this line here should be uh, alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2. But the y component or the, the height of this pawn here should be linear combination of this height here also. Right? So therefore it will be fx1 alpha plus 1 minus alpha fx2. So that, that's the pawn here, the location of this pawn here, the x component here and the y component here. And um, and this this height here, of course, will be, should be above the, the, uh, the pawn here. So therefore, this height here should be uh, should be bigger than equal to this f alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 here. And uh, this is a verification of something is convex. Basically, if you have for every point x1 and x2, like in that function, you have like this alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2, f x2 should be bigger than equal to f alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2. So again, like alpha is say like from 0 to 1. So this is this holds for any x1 and x2. But but you can just think of it graphically. If you, you, you don't know what I'm doing here, just graphically, you draw a line there and you figure out like the the line should always be above the curve. So anyway, like this is uh, just a quick review of convex function. So the Jensen inequality is like basically saying that if I have a convex function f and if I have a random variable like x, let's say x is a random variable. So then I will have the expectation of this, um, oops. Where did I move to? The expectation of fx will be bigger than equal to f uh, expectation of x. So um, I'm not going to show that, but like uh, you, you can just okay. Actually, it's not not difficult to show for this quick case, like. Um, I will just give some key step uh, because I, for discrete, we can just use this definition directly. For for discrete case, I just think of like the simplest case. Let's say if I the alphabet size is just I have, it's just have two different values. Like let's say x or like let me just one zero and one. Let's say let's say the alphabet can only be zero and one. Then then on the left hand side here will be just say I have like uh, expectation fx is just f zero, this is p zero plus p one, f one, right? And on this other side here, oh, okay, wait, wait a sec. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the right hand side here is basically just p zero, zero, plus P1, uh, it's, yeah, this this is okay, yeah, one. And uh, I have F of that. And you see that this is exactly the same as this inequality here. By the definition of conversity of this function here, of course, I will have this is less than equal to that because of course I have P0, plus p1, in this case, I, or I can think of p0 is just alpha, right? And p1 is just one minus alpha because I p0 plus p1 is is, um, is equal to one. Um, and then uh, you, you can just uh, add more, add um, a larger alphabet size. So if I have three of them, then you can just use in induction like multiple times then, um, you will, you will be able to show like for any number of, mm, I mean, for any alphabet size, I will always have the transient inequalities is, is true. So, okay, this one, I'll just keep that for x bigger than you could, or bigger than two proof using induction. So, but of course, like, this is only for discrete case. 
uh, but for continuous case, it's also, also true. Um, and for the proof, that would be more technical though. So, but anyway, so this, so at least uh, you, if you remember this small, simple case, you should be able to remember this inequality. So something like the expectation of fx, whenever f is converse, will be always bigger than equal to f expectation x. Now, oops, yeah, okay. So now let, let's show like what we have earlier using this Jensen inequality. We say that, <clears throat> Uh, hx right, is equal to expectation minus log px and uh, that I can write it as like expectation log 1 over px right? just just flip the sign there I mean yeah I mean make it inverse and and flip the negative sign here. But then uh, you look at this function here, this log function is actually convex um, because log function is, is oh, uh, wait a sec, actually, this is con, uh, yeah, that, uh, this is using the, uh, this is actually concave, like log function is concave. Uh, is that, yeah, log function is concave. But of course, I. Uh, yes, it's true. But uh, I I don't want to use minus lock here. <laughs> that's the the problem. But that's fine. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, uh, but apparently, this whole thing is symmetric. Like right? you can fit that convexity to concavity. The Jensen inequality, the proof you hold, I. Right? everything will goes well. So therefore another form for the Jensen inequality, um, x squared can be used. Um, um, okay, let, let me, okay, this is the converse, converse form for, so if f is converse, that will, I have this, that, I mean, I, I will have the Jensen inequality like this. But um, essentially, if I have something that's concave, like exactly fit that, the other side. So if F is concave, so I will have the Jensen inequality, like it's just exactly fit that. So um, and I, I will use this form basically. A log function is concave, so I will have a, uh, this expectation fx will be less than, so will be upper bounded by log uh, expectation one over px. But then this one is actually so equal to one because this is just equal to, oh wait, and then this is not equal to one. Okay, I'm sorry about that. This, uh, this is equal, equal to log uh, sum over px, one over px, right? x in all the, like for all the x here. This one is equal to one, but I'm summing over all the x in the alphabet there, right? So therefore it's uh, equal to the alphabet size here, it will be just equal to log the alphabet size here. So that, that's basically proof of like what we, what so earlier. So uh, let's see, I guess, uh, hmm, it's good time to break, but at the same time, uh, I, I am a bit slower than I thought. So, but anyway, I guess I will break for 10 minutes and maybe come back like for 40. So, but I'm a one anyway, if you have any questions, you can, you can raise your hand or like you can, yell uh, forever.
Okay, I guess we will continue, uh, but uh, I'm not sure you guys have back or have been back or not. Um, uh, I guess I, we, we need to plan for this logistic thing, say for your presentation. So um, I am thinking about like, if you, you, you guys have a Canada, uh, so I, I'm thinking I like may be starting uh, October 14, like what do you guys think? So, so the first presentation, so it looks like we have quite a few of you guys I still hang around. So uh, uh, I, I would expect like, uh, at least I feel weeks, I mean, feel like few classes like, uh, for presentations in this case. So how about like 14, like 21st and then 28th. So we will have these three classes for presentations. So I'm going to do a lot to it. So maybe, maybe next time or something like that. Like maybe, maybe uh, if I don't remember like you guys can remind me. So, um, we can do a quick lottery to um, to design like uh, the order of the presentation. So uh, it looks like we have, um, I think it's like 16 or 17, I don't know like how many of us. So, um, so let's, uh, let's plan for five each. So, but, um, so we, we may need like uh, to present a couple more, like that's will be what? November 4th, like. And uh, I guess we will have a pretty late midterm. So, um, What did you say was November 4th? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. This will be still presentation. So it looks like we, we uh, I like to check, but I think I, we have at least say 15 students. Say. So therefore, like, I, I, I guess I five per day is probably the mass we can go. Like, otherwise we will check very long, it looks like. So um, if we have like control like in 30 minutes, like per, per speaker, so then we can finish like about like two and a half hours. So I guess that we cannot pack six will be too much. Um, and um, and yeah, so so I guess I we will, I don't know, we may still have one or two presentation on November 4th. So, and um, we, we need to have a midterm, but it's like pretty late midterm, I guess I, uh, maybe 11 uh, midterm. So it's, um, I, I, might, I may do it just in class. So in the sense that maybe I uh, put the things in Canvas and let, let you guys want uh, work on that, uh, but maybe like uh, a little bit longer than, uh, I give you a bit more time than like just two and a half hours, maybe like can drag into seven or something like that. Um, so it, it will be open book, but, um, Therefore, like, uh, is uh, the question will, I, I won't say too challenging because, but 
most likely we will have seen that before, like either for the quizzes or like for for uh, the your homework. Uh, I may have like one question or something more more challenging, like you guys never uh, see that before. So, but okay, that that's probably like uh, the current schedule, like what I have in mind. So then, like uh, next time, like we we can decide the order. Like probably I can do a very quick log three in class and decide the presentation order. So anyone have any comments, suggestion, like uh, like and anything like you conflict your your like schedule somehow that you 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 think like you. I, I know this is a <laughs> it a spread for a long period of time. So, but uh, you will be presenting only one of the day. So, like, um, you shouldn't um, kind of like lead you too much time to prepare. Like, um, so, and um, and uh, to ensure that you guys uh, to have a kind of successful presentation, maybe I I will ask you guys to prepare for a let's see so what day is a today though uh so uh probably end of this month like today is what today is nine already so we we have about three weeks so you guys may may need to think a bit like some of you guys may present a like quite um uh, not far away so maybe like 30th okay like let, let, let me give maybe like even october 7 like i'll ask you guys to submit a just an abstract like for you what you are going to present so of course like for those like presenting in 14 like they they should think pretty much ahead like at that time like what what they but i just want to make sure you guys don't wait until the last two days to make the decision otherwise like there will be lots of pressure uh, I mean, like you, you, um, you at least will lead a week, I think, like to kind of prepare for a good presentation. So, um, so that that's that's my my current uh, schedule that I have in mind. So, again, if you have any comments, suggestions, and so on, I just wait now, or like you can uh, write it on the chat, or like you you guys can discuss on Discord as well. Like if you, um, yeah. Uh, if you have any concern you want to raise. So, okay, back to the technical materials. So we we have basically here, we have a bound here, hx. So therefore it's less than equal to log x and bigger than equal to zero. So um, next thing we are going to do will be, we will introduce more of this information measure. So the first thing, like the most apparent one will be, uh, I have definition of x, hx is just equal to expectation minus log pxy. So I can define like the h of like two random variables like x and y. So physically you can think of I have a drawn distribution pxy here. And, uh, and each time from this discriminable source, you sample like x and y at the same time, a couple each time. Now you, you think of like how much information for each of these couple, like on average will be like given by this x, x, y. So then just by a exactly the same um, logic, the same rationale, because uh, you can think of x, y is just one, one variable, right? So therefore, like this would be just equal to p, x, y, actually it'd be exactly uh, analogous to, to the case when you only have one uh, a single variable. Um, then with this, we can talk about uh, something more. We can talk about conditional entropy. So we, have, we can talk about conditional entropy, h, x given y. So what will be the conditional entropy? It will be something like, uh, let's say you, you, you have two random variable here, like X and Y here, and Y can take some alphabet, like this script Y here. 
So this script y will be a set of like maybe y1, y2 up to y, yn, uh, y, yk, let's, let's say. Um, and uh, so this H, x given y, what you can think of, what is it? It's essentially just an average um, of this hx given y1, um, and matrix given what weighted by like the probability of those y. So therefore it's just equal to matrix P Y one plus X X Y two P Y two. <clears throat> so you can think of like okay um when I have a different y whenever I have a different y, that conditional, conditional um, distribution, px given y will be different. So I have like x, uh, y1 will be different from like p, uh, px, y2, xy. So, but you can think of like, this is just two different distribution, right? This, now you can think of this y, y1, y2 here is just like some parameter. So you have like different parameters, you have a different distribution. And this is just a distribution of x, right? So I have this conditional distribution, but when I fix this y here, what you can think of this is just a same as like a distribution of x. What I mean by same is that, like it's, it have the same property, it's also like bounded by, uh, COM1 and also like when you sum over all x is equal to one, right? So if I sum over sum over x here should be just equal to one, right? And with that, like I can totally define the the entropy of this guy because the entropy of this guy will be then is just equal to expectation minus log p x given y one right x something like that actually I, I can put y one y two here because it's like fixed to be y one y two right or yeah something like this um this is actually equal I can think of this is h x given y one now because like this y one y two will occur y1, y2 will occur like with different probability, right? So in the sense, this will be just a weighted sum of like uh, all this conditional entropy. That is like when I um, condition a different y, y, i here. So, yeah, I guess it's a little bit too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I don't understand when you put um summation of probability of x given y one, or do you mean y i equals to one? The is that this one here? Yeah, this one. Yeah, is that y i or y one? Um. Okay. This. Okay. You can put y i here. It's actually for all i. Uh, because you think of like a conditional probability, like condition on something, this thing like when when you sum over x is always equal to one, way. Right? So I, I guess um, because like also you can think of like by base rule like what is p x given y? This is actually p x y over p y, right? And then like when you sum over x here, this y is actually just a constant with respect to x, I can pull it out. But I sum over, uh, for this pxy, I sum over x here, it will just marginalize to get me py. So therefore it will just, um, when I sum over x here, it will just equal to one. So let me maybe write one more step. This will be equal to py over py is equal to one. So this is true like for all conditional probability basically. Um, and and so therefore, like what, what what I want to say, like uh, I I maybe the notation look a little bit 
confusing, but sometimes when you think of a conditional probability, it's nothing different from just a regular probability, but parametrized by some other parameter. You can think of that that way. So what I think, okay, what can I think of this Px given y1 can be just a distribution of x, but when I change this different y, I have a different distribution. So I have like, uh, this distribution is like Px given y1. Okay, I'm sorry, I write it continuously, but you can think of this as discrete. So I can have like an other, something like another one. When I change to y2, I become this, this one, maybe Px given y2. So, but there are no difference from like regular distribution. So since there are no difference from regular distribution, I can totally use the same definition of hx for them. So then like, I can automatically define this hx given like yi or like y1 here will be just equal to this. Okay, this looked ugly, but like it's actually just equal to minus log. I can, I, actually I can omit this y1 here is a dummy here. I can just write like this. And uh, and this given y here essentially is just a parameter that parameterize your distribution. And for different y, you will have like different hx given y, right? And hx given small y. And this hx given big y, so therefore will be just weighted sum of this, weighted by like different probability of this small y here. So is, is that reasonable? Right? So because like, you think of like, uh, or uh, some other way to think of that is like, when you have different y, like you have a different distribution and you will have a, a different amount of information there. So for example, like I can think of, okay, let me, let me give a, a more concrete example here. So let's say I use this discrete memory less source again. Let me draw it here again. And I have X, I have Y here. And let's say my Y is only zero and one here. And uh, maybe my X also like also zero and one, maybe it's just conflict pain, like maybe head and tail or something like that. But I may have like zero and one correspond to diff two different cons. So maybe I, I have like zero is like for con zero and one is con one here. And they have different probability uh, distribution for x. So let's say I have like um, p x given c o here, like y equal to c o here, will uh, will have a hat that's equal to p, let's say, or maybe maybe equal to c o point five. For this case, uh, I'm biased con, let's say, and then I if I have y is equal to one here. The con is biased, let's say, say 70% uh, will be had. Now I can ask the words this hx given y now, or let, let me start with like h, x given small, hx given c o, like y is equal to c o first, like for this guy. So this one will be equal to one, right, as we, we just mentioned earlier. So what we'll have the probability of an unbiased con. So that case is just equal to when I have unbiased con, um, the, the entropy for that one is just equal to one. And if I have HS given y equal to uh, one here, I will have a bias con with probability 0 0.7. I am not a calculator, I don't know what's that value, but it's probably like maybe 0.4 or something. Like that's, uh, no, no, maybe 0.4 is too, too small. Um, maybe 0.8. Let me say 0 0.7 also, I don't know, but this would be equal to um, 0 0.7 log 0 0.7 plus 0 0.3 log 0 0.3 here. So now what, what is this hx given back y then? This hx given back y will then be equal to Weight the sum of these two guys, but this weight the sum will be depend on like what's the probability you have like a unbiased con and what's the probability of the biased con. So it will be depend on that way. Right? So if I have 
let's say if I have the PCO, like P, um, oh, let me just write it out. So I have like P, this would be equal to PY given, oh, maybe, yeah, let me, let me write like this, PY equal to zero P, um, H, H given zero plus P, Y equal to one, H, X equal to one, right? And we say this one is say one, and this guy is say 0.7. So, and, and the, the average, so here, like H, X given big Y here, essentially it's a half H under both scenarios. And uh, it depends on what's the probability when, when I have unbiased con and the bias con. If I have, uh, this is larger, like let's say if this, I always get an unbiased con, then let's say PY is equal to zero is equal to one, then I will basically will, this one will be just equal to one, right? So I, I will have a larger HX given back Y here. But if I have this one is smaller, I have most of the case I have like this, I have this bias con, so then the amount of information coming out of this X will be smaller then. So does it make more sense now? So, uh, okay, um, I have, but, but know that like what we have here is really, therefore it's just a weighted sum or like expectation of like, it has given this small y for for um, different, we can think of y again, a different parameter and for different cases and you just kind of weigh the sum together according to the probability of y. And um, so I have this defined this joint entropy, the conditional entropy. Then I think I can define one more. Then I can like give you guys a some numerical exercise for you guys to compute something just to have fun. Uh, so let's say I have, uh, I can also define I X Y. This is known as the mutual information. So by the way, this is the con conditional entropy, right? Con di 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 yeah, conditional entropy of x given y. So I, I have the mutual information. The mutual information is like, you can imagine like, what is the information between x and y? Uh, what's the information shared by x and y? And uh, it will be equal to, um, uh, H X minus H X given Y. Um, so the, the, the question now here is like, if, uh, let's see if I have, um, So I'm flipping my slides, seeing like if I, I have written down some nice explanation that um, actually I don't think I, I do here. <clears throat> Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I guess I um hmm. Let, 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 let's think of it this way. So the, maybe one motivation, one way to motivate this definition is that like, when we say something like has some mutual information is non zero, um, then I will have, um, I will have like if x and y, so i x y is equal to zero, then I I will mean that like x and y will be independent. So they are independent. So then like when will that like i x y is equal to zero? So x and y will be equal to zero when if you think of like h x given y is what h x given y is when you already know y, what will be the information you have you we will still remain like trying to extract from x so if you don't have like um if this is equal to zero that means that this will be exactly equal to this two will be exactly equal right so Meaning that like knowing why it won't help you in the sense like to um to uh okay. I I see that that problem. Like I I honestly what, what I'm trying to do here is like I trying to do um because I, I see that I was a speed like uh uh behind today. So I was thinking I want to go faster into a numerical example like without going through like differential entropy uh no 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 uh carrot divergence and so on um and uh but it looks like actually I, I i may be better to go along that before going to that so but um But let, let's stick to this schedule first. Like, let, let, let me still stick to not talking about carrot divergence here uh, today, like, but uh, until next week. So, because I actually, what originally I have, like, maybe a little bit, like, if I talk about carrot divergence and talk about image information, is say like I can illustrate that, like, image information has to be positive. So, but for the moment, okay, I, I will show it, okay later so i will prove later so I, I will show it like i promise i will show this but i since i'm i i want to stick to not talking about carrot divergence this time so therefore like um i i won't be able to show that like without going through clear divergence but for the moment you need to take me for granted that like the mutual information will be bigger than equal to zero and um and uh, so because this is bigger than equal to zero, what does that mean? It's like, I have hx uh, will be always bigger than equal to hx given y. Um, and, um, and, and also like, I will, in general, like in general, I, I will have this actually in general, I have a hx if like I have ixy is bigger than zero. I will have hx is bigger than hx given y here, um, strictly bigger than hx given y here. But on the other hand, if I, I have this is equal to zero, 
then I will have this two is equal. So, and um, here, like for, for the conditional entropy here, um, you, you, you can think of this condition as I explained here, like when, um, when I look at H is given small y, it's just like the amount of information of X for each of these cases here, right? So now if I have, um, with this big Y, it's like weighted some of this together. So then you can think of like this is like knowing each of this Y here, when for, for this H given big Y here, so it's knowing this Y here, what's the amount of information left for X here? So when you have like, um, this is equal to this, it's basically saying that like, even though you're giving Y, the amount of information given X here, essentially no change from the original. So therefore X and Y has to be independent, like uh, X, therefore I, X, Y is equal to zero. So, I guess, I guess probably this is the best way to explain this definition. So why, why we want this. And, uh, and jumping ahead, like, um, let me, we can like group all this information into a light span diagram here. So I have this X and Y. I can define, okay, this big circle here, and then just this circle here is HX. And this guy here. is HY. Now I can nice call this here is HY given X. And uh, this part here is HX given Y. And the part in the middle here is IXY. Um, so I, I, I'm kind of like, I guess I, I, I'm teaching this like quite a bit different from my previous time. I usually go um, to prove all these things. I am show this at the very end, but like, um, let me show, show this to you first. And then I, I'm see like if this, this way is better than my previous way. So, um, and then, um, so you, you have a big picture now. So what is H is, H is, H is given Y and I, X, Y and what they are related. And of course, like we already mentioned earlier that like, okay, these guys are all bigger than equal to zero, right? HX is bigger than zero, HY is bigger than zero, and so on. And this guy, HY given X, it's, it's, all this would be bigger than zero as well because um, remember like HX given Y is just way the sum of this guy, right? And each of these guys is like bigger than equal to zero. And PY, all this PY is bigger than equal to zero here. And, um, so therefore these two are also bigger than equal to zero. And this is bigger than equal to zero, but I, I didn't prove it yet. So I'm going to prove it later on like, next time. So, but uh, for the moment you, you will take, take it for granted, like this is bigger than equal to zero. So therefore like I, in general, I will have like HY is bigger than HY given X and so on. Um, so, but, we, um, let's see. With this, like, I still have one more information measure I need to um, introduce. So, um, of course, like, I have many more, depends on I have more variables. I can have like HX. If I have three variables, I can HX, Y, Z, right? And then I, like, um, I, I can look at H, X, Y given Z and so on. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but I guess I, I, what I want to say is I, I, I want to, I want to introduce these guys first. It's like, this is X, Y given Z. I, X, Y given Z is the, the mutual information between X and Y given Z. And, uh, by the way, I just said that like IXY 
is equal to zero, that is actually will means that like x y will be independent. That means I, I will have px y is equal to px py. And uh, by very similar token, like for this condi conditional mutual information, I have this guy is equal to zero. It means that like x and y will be conditionally independent given z. And that is basically the same as like px y given small z is like px given z and p multiplied by py given z. Um, So okay, I, I guess I, I'll pause here. Like, what I'm going to do is I, I'll give a oh, by the way, like I, okay, like this one here, I haven't defined it yet. So what do you think of what this is supposed to be? Just use analogy. What, what do you think like this is supposed to define? What's the definition of that? Okay, I let me make this question for like as a guess again. Like what what, what how how are you going to define this? Yes, mutual information of x, uh, y given. Uh, let me uh, say this again. Like this one. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. This uh, is define i i x y given z. So this this one, like original i x y, is defined as h x minus h x given y. Oh, actually, I, I guess I, before trying to let you answer this, maybe I should elaborate more like for this guy. Um, Let, okay, let, let, let me look at this one first. Maybe that, that would be better. Like give you a better idea for this guy. Let, let, let me see if I can rewrite this guy into some form here. So this one is a uh, expectation minus log P X. That's an interesting guess. So let, 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 let me look at this one again. So this one is, uh, oh, maybe, maybe this one, like even like HX given Y here. Yeah, there's a lot of like interesting guess. So actually, but but I guess I really forgot like to to 
um, show what is this like. Um, Oh, true, but be careful. Like um, uh, for the rotation here, like um, uh, of course I cannot say for everyone, but like for the canonical rotation like in in the information field test books and so on, like you you have like um, um this uh, know that this semicolon and colon things like um, and uh, comma like we need to be very careful. Like oh, sometimes I omit this comma here. But um, I have h x comma y here, so this is like um, it's essentially it's like p x y log p x y here. So sum over this guy here, and uh, when I say this mutual information here, so um, this is mutual information between x and y. And I I can for example I can write something like i x uh, y and z. So it's it's like the mutual information between x, y, and z. So therefore, like here I use semicolon and this here I use comma. And for entropy, like I uh for the canonical notations, they always use comma here. Hmm. So I, I'm thinking, okay, maybe I should why this like in this form first say like for each of these guys then maybe you have a better idea like how they look like for hx and hxy is apparent where right? it's like just i've written down here hx is just like px uh, log px it's like this so this is hx and for hxy here is something like p I, I have, um, as I said, like HXY, I can think of it as like, uh, is something like H, X given small y, PY sum over y, right? That, that's what we described earlier. So I just use a summation notation here. Um, and, uh, and this is equal to, and this guy is equal to uh, minus, or maybe I put a minus inside, is equal to p x given y, right? Log p x given y, I have this minus sign here, sum over x, and my p y, sum over y, right? So this guy here is h x given y. So therefore I, I can just put the summation together, I have x y, sum over x and sum over y, uh, py multiplied px given y is minus pxy, right? pxy, and log px given y. So this is actually, this is actually uh, hx given y. And, um, So therefore, before even getting into my, our question four here, <laughs> or you you can you you can also try to represent that like into um, into this form, although, although it's harder to write. For example, like if I write this i x y as like this probability distribution, what would be i x y? So I have um, uh, e e e e r uh, e is the oh, okay. I do have this. Okay, yeah. So Yes, 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 yes. True, like you can write in this form, like uh, in the summation form. So, um, so, but I guess I let, let me let me let me uh, write the summation form for like x y first, like for some of you guys. So, 
what, what will be this one? So I this one is equal to h x minus h x given y, right? So that is equal to um I have h x is equal to sum of x p x log p x and minus this is plus this is sum over x y p x y log p x given y here and then now i can i can rearrange the term and this one i have some over x but i can sum over x y i can sum over y also i can or basically i can write this p um Yes, so um, but let me let me uh, okay. So this guy here, uh, I what's that like? Yeah, at px I can write as like sum over pxy y way. So px is equal equal to pxy marginalized for y. So therefore I can make two summation here, right? Uh, px. So then like this pxy is the same thing. So I can um, I can rewrite this as like minus log px plus log p x given y here. So, or like this sum if I x y, p x y log p x given y over p x. So this is, this is i x y. And of course, like this guy, I can write it for base rule, using base rule, this is also equal to p x y. P y so this this is i x y and for this guy like you you become easier to see why i x y equal to zero that means that like it's independence because when i x y is equal to zero, or like when if you have independence then these two guys will be the same so it'll be just log one always so therefore i x y is equal to zero Yes, I think a couple of, of you like is correct, I believe. So um plus you know I actually I cannot uh Download your your screen capture. It's like the file looks weird. Like it's too small. Only twelve k by yeah. So I I think like I see some of you guys uh make a correct guess. So um. What we want is like if we want to define something is conditional. Uh. So this conditional mutual information. So we, we, we basically want to have a same similar property as the mutual information. Basically when like this conditional mutual information is equal to zero, then um, X and Y is uh, conditionally independent given Z. So um, I think like some of you make a correct guess, like, this will be something like that, x, y, z, log uh, p, x, y given z, p, x given z, p, y given z. So if you have a definition like this, then um, uh, this will be um, conditionally uh, um, independent whenever this term is equal to zero because uh, when is when when we have like conditionally independence of x and y given z, then like these two will be equal. Then I will have um, 
log one and so on. And, and like many of you guys are correct as well, like you can write it and as another form. So if you if you look at this here, let's see, I I I'm, I can erase this way, maybe. Uh, see, let's see how how do I see that? Like this look a little bit more troublesome. So this guy, I can write it as like using base rule. So this this one above is equal to px given z and py given xz, right? Times this is like px given z over py given xz. So then I, I will have these two cancel that have performed something like that. Then if I look at the one above, it's actually just equal to H. Actually, it's equal to minus HY given XC for the one above. And the one below is actually equal to uh, plus HY given Z. Um, right? Yes, yes. So therefore, like, um, one correct answer will be like that. I x y given z can be will be defined as something like that, or like you can also write it like say h. Uh, I, I okay, I can flip the order, but I, it's I can, you can also write it as h x given z minus h x given y z. Um. Yes. Uh okay. I guess I will have. We have quite a lot of questions today. So, um, so what, uh, what I'm going to do this, should I give you guys some new macro exercise or not? So I'm thinking like, so uh, let's see. What time is it? Yeah, maybe maybe not. I guess I uh, because I we only have like twenty minutes or something. Yeah, twenty minutes or something. So um, okay. Uh, so maybe like uh, I'll end this with something more interesting. So uh, because I I know this is pretty dry. So that's why I I I decided this time not to go to kill the virgins and try to prove everything and then I. So because otherwise I think the whole lecture will be derivation and so on. So, but then I, I was a little bit stuck thinking like what, how should I introduce the definition of I, X, Y? Um, but hopefully you guys kind of like get, get the idea. Anyway, the definition here is like, um, you, you, uh, we cannot take it too analytic, too literally, but uh, I guess the insight is important is that you have i x y is equal to zero, that will the same like x y will be independent and like also uh, i x y given z is equal to zero will be x y will be conditionally independent given z. And also like I have h x given y can be treated as the amount of information of x given y is known, y is known. So that that that's uh, this uh, this uh, this intuition is important. So and um, so as I said, like I, as I just promised, like I I'm going to talk about something more interesting at the end. Um, so I I will talk about something like secrecy, like this the notion of perfect. Oh, I, I think I. It, misspelled like perfect is that is that spelled that way yeah i think it's it is actually it's okay perfect secrecy uh, this is something by shannon uh, it's also one of his famous paper so the idea is following so you, you just just like he of course he introduced this work in the 40s and 50s something like so it's totally ahead of all this uh, crypto cryptography. There's no cryptography at that time. So, 
so uh, completely ahead of its time. So you think of like you have some message, let's say, uh, let me make sure I use the same notation as my notes here. So let's say I have uh, a message. This is uh, some message, like just plain text. This is the message here, the message, plain text message. And then um, now I, I'm go going to encrypt that somehow into some cipher test. So it becomes some C here cipher test. Uh, cipher test. Now I will have some key, key, key is key here, some key K here. So with the key and the cipher test, I should be able to recover M here. So, and um, now what, what's sh the Shannon perfect secrecy theorem said is something like, um, if I want to have like perfect secrecy, so what what do we what does it mean by perfect secrecy? Is that like if I given the cipher test, um, uh, let's see, if I only given by the cipher cipher test, but not given the Plain test, and I'm sorry, not not given the key here. So that means that if I only look at the cipher test and the plain test, not knowing the key, I would say like I have perfect secrecy only when these two have mutual information equal to zero. So does this sense make sense? Because they they should be completely independent. So. If I only get in the cipher test here without the key, if I don't know this key here, there's no way I can infer any information from the of the original message here. So remember that like what is HC given now, uh, uh, sorry, uh, the mutual function information between C and M is equal to HC minus XC given, uh, I, I guess maybe it's better to write it the other way. H M minus H M given C, right? So what it means is I think of like the amount of information of the message and I'm trying to guess that amount of information of the message. If, if I have the cipher test, I'm going to need less amount of information to recover my message that would means that like um, I I will I I will I I I will be able to leak out some information of the message to the cipher test way. And on the other hand, if this is equal to zero, meaning that like even I give I'm given by this this cipher test, I still have no no way to. Um, reduce the amount of information of that message, then I should have like perfect secrecy. Like there's no nothing leak to this cipher test here. So that that's the content. This is basically the Shannon condition here. So you, you guys agree with that? Like does it make sense? Does it sound reasonable? So now that that's something interesting coming up. Um, the interesting conclusion of this perfect secrecy condition is that like, given that the consequence is that the, the information of the key will be as big as the message itself. So that means that like, if you want to get perfect secrecy for for whatever like or like perfect encryption or whatever then your key has to be as long as your message itself or like contain as amount of information as the message itself um so of course it's not desirable that means that if you have like um but that that's basically first challenge i mean in practice therefore like none of the Crypto cryptographic system is actually perfectly secret. Um, 
because I, we all know that like we have oh, like all this system that like you have keys maybe like uh, 2000 bit um, I mean 2000 I don't know what's in terms of bits like size of keys or say something like that but we never have the size of the keys as long as the message itself Um, I'm sorry, what's this condition? HK is greater than H message? Oh, okay. This, this is a field metric. Nice. We will need a proof for that. This is like from here. If we want this perfect secrecy, if you agree with this guy here, then you will lead to a conclusion like this, basically. So, so that if you guys will try to prove that, like, I don't know. Uh, you, you may try to try to play around your definition here, like moving things around, maybe you uh uh so, uh I guess probably not. Like this, this one is probably like need a little bit uh more thought. But like, but just look at this. This is actually interesting, right? Because this one here look completely reasonable. Like we have this condition that okay, um, if something is perfectly secret, I really should expect like there's no leakage of information um, from the cipher test, like related to the plain test way. Right? But like if I agree with that that we will have this interesting outcome here. So um, I, I guess maybe I'll just quickly show this, like maybe maybe that, that will end uh, the class today, maybe like, uh, so uh, let's see where, where should I get started. So let, let's consider um, MK, this, this one, like the, what's this? Like what's, okay, let's start step by step. Like, okay, what, what's this guy? Say, so what was the value for this guy? HM given KC. So, okay, this of course is bigger than, okay, I would mention like the entire class that like the, all the entropy things I will be bigger than equal to zero, right? Uh, but here I will claim this is equal to zero. Do you agree with that? Like why, why I can claim that? HM, this is equal to zero. Intuitively, I would assume that it's because given the key and the ciphertext, you're supposed to be able to recreate the message. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like because I, given the key and the ciphertext, that, that's, the message is deterministic. This is, uh, yeah, that's what we mentioned earlier. Anything is deterministic, the entropy is equal to zero. So therefore, this, this would be equal to zero. So, but um, I can write, um, uh, H, let's say Y H M K C. Um, oh, okay. Actually, <laughs> I I didn't uh didn't show these things yet, but um um in. in let me let me show this at this the same moment. I will, I, I, I will argue that this is equal to H M given C plus H K given M 
see something like this. Oh, or actually, I, I want the other expression here. Actually, HK given C, HM given K, C. So I have something like a train rule, like in general, for example, if I have H, A, B, C, like let's say this A, B, C are all random variable, I have H, A given C plus H, B given A, C here. So um, you can very easy to show this because um, this is equal to, let's see how, this is equal to expectation minus log P A B given C, right? The first one here. But I can write it as a expectation minus log using the kind of the base rule like for probability is like P A given C, P B given A C, right? So then it will be become expectation minus log P A given C uh, plus expectation minus log P B given A C. So therefore like this guy is H A given C and this is a H B given A C. Okay, that's hard to see. Let me wait back. H B given A C. Yeah. So again I um so therefore, like, I can have this guy is equal to this plus this, right? And uh, we know this is equal to zero, right? So this is equal to zero. And um, so therefore, like, I have um, H, H, M. And of course, I, okay, let, let me write also like this one. I, I can write, write as HMK given C is HK, HK given C plus this guy here, this guy is equal to zero. But I also can write the other way is like HM given C plus H, uh, let's see, make sure, yeah, K given MC, right? So, and, uh, so therefore I have, what I have here is I, I will have this, this side is equal to this side here. So because I, for all these entropy things has to be positive, therefore I will have something like H M given C will be less than equal to H K given C. Um, and also like, um, HK given C here uh, is equal to HK minus I K C here. Uh, so, and also like we mentioned, like all this mutual information is positive. So therefore like this is less than equal to HK. So we already have something very similar to what we have here, what we want here. I have like HK will be bigger than HM given C. But then like we already have this, already we are done. So because for the early assumption here, if we want perfect secrecy, we'll have HM given C is equal to HM. So therefore it should be equal to HM here. So therefore we'll have HM is less than equal to HK. So um, I, I guess like uh, that's it. We are two minutes uh, uh, ahead. Even though like I jump, jump. I mean I have skipped some materials and uh, we'll delay it for next uh, class. So, but more or less, I guess at least we ended like with this perfect secrecy here. So, uh, do you have any questions like for for? Anything like in particular for just this uh, perfect secrecy example here? So, hearing okay, hearing none. So I guess I will will just earn a little. Uh, I mean, 
uh, end a little bit early, like today, like maybe just one minute early. So I will see you guys next week then. I, I may post another homework today. So um, yeah, I will let you know. I will email you guys. Um, yeah. Okay. See you next time. See you guys. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah.